Good evening. My name is Sister Kathleen Duffy and as president of the American Teilhard Association, as well as director of the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College, I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's program. And a particularly warm welcome to those who are joining us for the first time. The American Teilhard Association was established in 1967 to extend knowledge of the cosmic vision of Teilhard de Chardin, to encourage its critical study and to apply his thought as we examine humanity's place in the cosmos, as well as our responsibility for directing the development of an evolutionary world. I encourage you to become a member of our organization. You can find information on our website. And at the end of this, the program, I will again show you the uh, website address. The Institute for Religion and Science is a regional center exploring spirit, science and spirituality. It was established 12 years ago to promote the constructive engagement of religion, spirituality with science and technology, and to encourage a dialogue that is interfaith, multi-science and civil. And to this end, we sponsor lectures, reading circles, conferences, and other programs. And you can also check our website, which well, I will give you the address. Uh, and on both websites, we have a number of wonderful lectures, former lectures that we've recorded. And um, uh, I think I know people are really thrilled once they, they uh, begin to, to uh, watch some of them. So we invite you to enjoy. And so uh, I just want this evening, I want to, to tell you something about the way we will proceed. Uh, I will introduce our speaker, Dr. Tracy Higgins, and she will share her lecture. And then we will take time for questions. And what we suggest is that whenever you have a question, please put it in the chat. Even during the lecture, if there's something that occurs to you, and uh, once Tracy's finished, Dr. Andrew Del Rossi will um, try to present as many of those questions as possible to Tracy. So I'll have plenty of time for some questions. And so now it's my, really my great privilege and pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tracy Higgins. Tracy came to know Teilhard during her years living in France. She now lives in New York, but as Gertrude, Gertrude Stein used to say, Paris is her hometown. She lived in Paris during her formative adult years as a counterintelligence liaison officer assigned to work with the French security and intelligence services. She empathizes with Teilhard's profound attachment to France, where, as he wrote to his cousin Marguerite, the spirit seems to blow stronger. Nevertheless, she appreciated the opportunity to return to her family's native New York, where she earned a PhD in nursing from Columbia University. Her, this experience nurtured an acute awareness of the contrast between life in the United States and life in France, and how a native is indelibly imprinted by early experiences and relationships. This evening, Tracy will explore the last four years of Teilhard's life in New York, his medical condition, his psychological state from a Jungian perspective, and his experience of exile. She will also discuss observations from witnesses to Teilhard's enduring struggle in New York that are not readily accessible to most readers. Recently, Tracy published much of this work in issue number 86 of Teilhard Studies. If you're a member, you received a copy, and so you'll be able to go back and look for more details uh, when, when, uh, you know, when you get back, back where you are home, but when you get a chance to find your copy. If you haven't already gotten and received a copy, you can go to our website and order one. Um, and so... Now, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Tracy and ask all of us to do that. Tracy, please. <laughs> 
Hello, everyone. I, I am really excited to spend the evening here with my uh, Teilhardian friends. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I am Tracy Higgins. Um, I've been studying Teilhard since about 2000, just before moving back to France, uh, where I got to know Father Tom King and the archives, the Teilhard archives at Georgetown, and went to see Teilhard at his grave at that time, which hadn't gotten much attention at that moment. But I see that that has been changing over the years, as we saw a couple of weeks ago in our visit to the gravesite. So I don't know how many of you have actually read the ATA monograph on Teilhard in New York. That was your homework for, uh, for tonight. Um, but I, I wanted to maybe explore some aspects that didn't really make it into the, to the monograph because it would have been just too much. Um, I, but while I was creating this monograph, I didn't really know where it was going to go. So I tried to gather as much detail as I, as I could about the last four years of Teilhard's life. And I ended up with a theme sort of unintentionally that emerged um, from my reading. And that related to an additional sacrifice that Teilhard made in his life that hadn't received much attention. And I guess I would have to call that a sort of homesickness. You know, we don't think of Teilhard being homesick because we think of Teilhard as a man who lived his life all over the world, um, who quoted, and I think we've seen this uh, in, in a lot of places, the age of nations is past. The task before us now, if we would not perish, is to build the earth. So this doesn't sound like a guy who's particularly attached to one country, one place, um, suggesting that, you know, he stresses the unity of the world or at least the future unity. But the theme that emerged in my work focused on Teilhard's attachment to the land and the people that imprinted him in his youth and his young adulthood. Most of what is written on Teilhard is about his work, his vision, his message, which is, of course, the most important. But I've always been impressed by the messenger himself, as I feel that the credibility of what is communicated is represented by the person doing the communicating. So Teilhard has a lot of street cred in this regard, considering not only his extended exiles, several exiles, but his military service with the men in the field, with no concern for his own safety, um, his incredible generosity, and his courage. He maintained the initial insights that he had as a young person throughout his life, but continuing to clarify and expand on it throughout his life, while experiencing um, these personal challenges and the inner turmoil, uh, while never pulling back and never taking a stoic attitude, attitude towards life. He maintained his personal connection completely in the moment from what we can tell, all the while keeping his eye on the future and that is way out into the future. So tonight, what I'd like to do is make first some general comments about Teilhard in this last part of his life and then make some observations about his health situation and his death. Then I can't help but make some amateur psychological observations as a longtime student of Jung. And then I'll finish with some words on the meaning of exile itself in a larger context. And finally, I'll make a plea for everyone to learn French uh, because I'd like to mention and maybe show you, I think I pulled out some of the books uh, that are about Teilhard, written by actual witnesses, people that knew him while he was alive. And these are books that I would like to translate in my next retirement, um, which is hopefully a little bit less eventful than my current one. So um, we know Teilhard, I think, as a visionary or, or even a saint who belongs to the whole world, and to an extent this is true. But even Teilhard himself didn't always recognize how integral one's relationship to the land, their immediate circumstances, their connection to their early environment, how important that is to their inner life, their emotional life. And I was lucky to have caught this quote um, that he wrote in a period but long before New York. He wrote it um, in letters to two friends um in the 30s after he had already spent many years in china so he writes either to ida or to Ida, i'm not quite sure but in that book he writes after so many years spent in china i did not realize that i am still so much rooted spiritually in the native ground 
There's something, something deeply human and instructive in this faith and attachment to ground and familiar trend, something which has to be preserved even in the biggest transformation of human society. This experience came to me as a good warning at the time when I am more and more involved in the discovery of the true outlines of humanity. So this tells me that when, Chi when Teard was in China for so many years, he most certainly had a longing for France and all the places and the people that he loved. So I don't think I should downplay the pain of exile. Um, even when we're thinking about so, someone had such a brave and brilliant adventurer as Teilhard was. So I think we have to think about that personal connection and how painful that must have been for him in itself. So by the time he gets to New York at the last stage of his life, Teilhard was so focused on the future, um, despite ironically, he his career was obviously a, a study of the past. Um, he was a paleontologist. He was studying bones. He was still studying bones in a way when he got to Winter Grand in New York, although he was leaning more towards the anthropological studies at that point, but he was still studying bones. So his, his career was the past, but when he got to that point in his life, he says, you know, I'm just really more interested in the future at this point. I'm not that interested in the past. Um, he was always talking about this heading towards Omega uh, or union differentiates and en haut and en avant or above and ahead. Um, this is what was most on his mind at that point in his life when he was in New York, this above and ahead all the time. And anecdotally, just to give a, sort of a comparison about Ter how he was always thinking about the future, anecdotally, uh, Father Almagno, who's a Franciscan, um, an original member of the ATA, he knew Teilhard's roommate when he lived in New York, Father de Breuvry. He knew him personally, he met with him. And it's funny how de Breuvry also mentioned that Teilhard was always focused on the future. Uh, de Breuvry worked at the UN, he was working on water projects, so he was focused on the here and now. Uh, but he would mention that Teilhard was always just thinking 500 years out. Don't worry, things will be better. Give it 500 years or so, things will be different. Um, so. The focus on the future might mean that an appreciation for the immediate influences of his earthly interactions could perhaps be overlooked. Um, Teilhard, while highly engaging and empathetic, was not an ostentatiously sentimental person as he described himself in his reactions to like the Christmas holiday events that they had in New York. He mentions to his brother his annoyance at some of the sentimental overtures that people made at holiday time and also the people, the witnesses that knew him uh, talk about him in this way. So um, I think what we see from, from what we've mentioned is that from that quote that I gave you is that even Teilhard himself is sort of surprised at his reaction to the idea of home, how much it meant to him and how much he didn't realize that as he's working on these much grander uh, ideas. And this realization actually predated his assignment um, for his exile to New York. So in going to New York, um, Teard was essentially forced into this uh, last exile uh, by the Vatican, by the superiors, by the, by the authorities. Um, sometimes it seems like everybody was against him, but some people were for him and tried to support him, tried and certainly tried to protect him. Uh, but others in, um, in positions of authority made the decisions that you know, he needed to be somewhere else where he was not as visible and he was, didn't have that kind of reach uh, with his uh, new ideas. And you can read a little bit more about this. I'll mention at the end in the making of the phenomenon of man, which I'll mention at the end. So all this was happening at a time when his physical powers were weakening. Um, he'd already suffered a heart attack in 47, and that was followed by a bout of pleurisy, I think in 49. Um, and that pleurisy never really resolved, uh, as, as x-rays showed. Um, he made allusion when he got into New York, he made allusion to that, to the fact that this is kind of like arriving in China, the exile he experienced going to China, but this time I'm 70 years old. So he was really feeling his age and the people he loved most were in France, you know, his cousin, his closest friends, especially the Jesuits, the Jesuits that he respected most and relied upon for feedback in his work. 
And in France was, you know, his family, his intellectual peers that he really yearned to be with and the land that he knew so well that he was intimately connected to from his youth in Auvergne. But instead, in the forced exile in New York, as really interesting and pleasant as some of his circumstances may have been, he was still limited to um, kind of an uncomfortable living situation in that he was surrounded by colleagues he, he didn't really connect with. Um, the Jesuits at St. Ignatius were very orthodox, um, although, and that was just the Jesuits there, he did actually meet other Jesuits, um, more forward-looking Jesuits, when he went to visit Fordham. So he was very happy to meet some Jesuits at Fordham who had um, a little bit more liberal ideas. And he also met folks from America Magazine when it was at 108th Street. He usually often stayed with them earlier when he visited. Um, so that was a little bit promising for him. And he also met Jesuits from Woodstock. Um, Woodstock was um, outside of DC, it was in Baltimore, I think at that time. And there was actually an offshoot of, of um, Woodstock in New York. I don't know if they actually had an office or it was just Jesuits who um, came to New York after being assigned um, there at Woodstock. But they're still today, just as an aside, a very active group of lay people who are aging, um, who were connected to that group of Jesuits who were from Woodstock in New York, they created a very tight group of lay people who to this day still continue to meet in New York. So it was a very strong um, movement um, there that was kind of going on at the same time as this strong conservative movement. So there was there was really a rift between the two. So for Teilhard um, and his feelings about being there with, surrounded by the Jesuit de St. Ignatius, he said in his letters, you know, he couldn't really speak with American priests on spiritual matters. He said that, you know, the church from uh, the Americans, from Americans in general, tend, tends to hide its grandeur, 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 rather than reveal it. So as I mentioned, Father de Breverie, who came to work at the UN as an economist, he was a godsend for Teilhard. I mean, in France, the two of these probably would not have been close friends because they were you know, quite different personalities. But by virtue of being two French Jesuits in New York, they necessarily became very close companions. And Teilhard specifically said, you know, thank God for Father de Breverie, because uh, this is a man I can talk to. I can't talk to American priests about God, <laughs> believe it or not. So this was so important to him. And they stayed together as roommates for a good period of time uh, while he was in New York. So um, I try to present a balanced picture of his time in New York with both the wonderful contacts and supporters he had, along with the challenges. Um, you know, he had, if you read the, um, the little book, um, he, had a, he had great support from the Strausses um, and from Childs Frick um, and spent a lot of time at their beautiful estates outside of town, really sumptuous uh, places to visit, um, but it's still, was not post-war Paris, um, which had, I don't know if you're familiar with post-war Paris, but uh, it had the collective experience of trauma, but also this like explosion of creativity. Um, but these are all really just logistical details. Um, but I think more importantly here, we're focusing on exile. What is the state of mind for someone who near the end of life is cut off from their roots? even someone with such an expansive cosmological vision. You know, I asked myself in the focus on the spiritualization of matter, did Teilhard forget about the demands of matter on the spirit? Is this a bi-directional process? So I, I start to think about this, uh, maybe because of my background uh, my now in the medical field. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the medical aspect. Um, it's well known that Teilhard suffered from bouts of anxiety at certain points of his life. Not strangely, when he was in the trenches of a horrific war, but at other times, a little later in life. And I, fo I focus on the last years, and it's unsurprising that he suffered anxiety at that time because he was a heart patient. Heart patients suffer anxiety. Uh, cardiology was not then what it is now. Um, they didn't have any imaging or stents, um, beta blockers, uh, ACE inhibitors. Um, the, pretty much the prescription at that time, from what I can tell, was just rest. 
Um, but heart conditions do produce anxiety and anxiety worsens a heart condition. This is a bi-directional process. So Teilhard suffered from heart disease as evidenced from his earlier heart attack. There was no indication of heart disease in his parents that we know of. They both died at a late age, well into their 80s when they passed away, and there was no similar problem in his siblings. Three of his brothers died young in the war. His sister Gigi had an undiagnosed illness throughout her life. I think now we could sort of diagnose this, but it was a rare illness that left her bedbound most of her life. And another sister, um, healthy enough for a posting in China, also died young of yellow fever contracted overseas. But there was nothing clearly associated with Teilhard's genetics or environment that would be associated with an increased risk of heart disease. Um, he wasn't overweight um, and he was pretty physically active. He did smoke, um, but from what we can tell, not a lot. And I think he did take a drink, but I don't think he drank often from what we know. Uh, and even at an advanced age, in my reading, one of his colleagues described him as bounding up the stairs at his advanced age. So he seemed to be in fairly good shape. But what he did have was relentless frustration and disappointment in the pursuit of what he held most important in life. I think it's unnecessary here to revisit the number of times his innocent trust in others came back to harm him thinking back to the paper on original sin, and I'll describe later um, a description given by his uh, superior day to Father Duins, who describes his, um, his it's, it's almost like an innocent naivete on his part, or the number of times uh, Mother Church via Vatican authority misunderstood, punished, or humiliated him, or the number of times his dream of retiring back to his beloved home country, the only place on earth where the spiritual air could comfort and sustain him, were dashed. So uh, we know slightly more now than we did then about heart disease. And while a broken heart was only metaphorical at that time, now we know that the heart can in fact be damaged by severe emotional distress. So Tatsubo syndrome, which um, is the Japanese word, the name for broken heart syndrome is a thing and it's become better understood recently. Now, even athletes with excellent heart-lung capacity can suddenly display symptoms of heart disease following a severe emotional upset. And these symptoms can actually get worse if the distress continues and can damage the heart. Now, for the healthy, the damage is reversible. But for those with comorbidities related to the cardiovascular system, it can be more serious. Fortunately, now the syndrome can be recognized and the damage can be mitigated. Um, in a bi-directional relationship, I would say that persistent anxiety may injure the heart, while an injured heart causes anxiety. So stress cardiomyopathy, which is caused by persistent stress hormones, such as you know, adrenaline or norepinephrine, released into the blood vessels of the heart, if it's not treated, it can actually alter the size of the left ventricle. And you probably know your basic biology, that's the main heart muscle that supplies the greatest force for the blood to be propulsed throughout the heart. So when the mechanism does not work efficiently, um, a person can experience secondary effects such as anxiety or worse, a stroke, especially when one already suffers from coronary artery disease. So as I said, cardiology as especially did not exist in the 1950s, although I do recall when Terrard was being treated in France, he did have a very famous doctor who was associated with heart. And I can't remember his name off the, right off the bat. I'm gonna have to look into my books to remember it. But by the time it was in New York, um, you know, he didn't have a heart specialist. He, he didn't have a cardiologist. So Teilhard got a recommendation for a local physician from his friend, Malvina Hoffman, because she herself had whatever medical problems that she had. Malvina had also referred Lucille Swan um, to the same doctor. So um, it seems that Teilhard's doctor, Dr. Samard, he was not a specialist, but perhaps someone whose uh, bedside manner was well appreciated. Um, I mean, he knew his patients well enough to have called Lucille um, from his office during one of Teilhard's visits um, because he was so um, 
distressed at his office. He was so depressed. So Dr. Simard called Lucille and said, maybe you should come here and, 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 and talk to him. Um, I don't know if how many doctors do that now, but this was um, very good patient engagement, I would have to say. So he, he did have a doctor who was very much involved in his care, but nothing in terms of a heart specialty, I don't think. Um, and again, um, imaging, we didn't have it. Health monitoring, we're not the same as we have now. They didn't put stents. You know, stents might have been helpful. They didn't have that back. I think stents began in the 1980s. So little was known about Teilhard's health status except for that earlier heart attack he had in 47 and the serious bout of pleurisy he had in 49. So this added further to his uncertainty and anxiety, not only physiologically, but also mentally because he, his hope of obtaining a permanent visa to the US was dependent on a clean X-ray to show that his lungs were okay. So if he still shows a spot on his lungs, he's not going to get that um, that visa. Um, so this status as a temporary visa holder was another source of anxiety for Teilhard, as he feared leaving the country. I mean, he wanted to go back to France to visit, but then he thought, well, if I do that and I'm on a temporary visa, I may not get back in. So he was really trying hard for that permanent visa. He had um, requested help from the former U.S. ambassador to. I think to Japan, who was by this time, he, I think he was retired, but he had risen to the ranks of the SES um, level in Washington, but apparently he couldn't even do anything for him. And again, it wasn't that Taird was that attached to New York. It's just that he knew that if he did not have this position in New York, um, he wouldn't be able to go back to Paris to live. Instead, he risked being assigned to a retreat house somewhere. Um, and his boss, Ravier, explains this to him. Um, and if that were to happen, he would lose contact with the stimulating working intellectual environment that he had and comfort of some friends nearby. So that would be even a worse exile for him to be sent to a retreat house somewhere. So at this stage in his life, when his powers were weakening, he literally had no home. He couldn't go back to his true home in France, and he had no confidence in his ability to stay where he was. And there was no medication, no, no mention of any medications, you know, that he was taking, except for some um, Sony roll tablets that he took for sleeping, which he had sent from France. But that's the only um, indication I can hide any medications. So Tanker described himself as rather anxious as a youngster already. His father held him back one year following his graduation with his aunt, with honors from Mongre, um, because he feared he was exhausted. So he took him to rest at an old family property um, where when Terrod was a young man, just embarking on this promising future, ironically remarks in his journals that all things must pass away. Um, so, I mean, I, I get Teilhard saying that, but if you have like a son who's on a gap year between high school and college, and he's talking about how thing, all things must pass away, these days we'd probably send them off to like a psychiatrist or something. Um, but this is, this is, I guess that was what Teilhard wrote, what he thought at that time. So he's already conscious of things way beyond his years, which is not surprising. Um, he re Teilhard recounts his distress as a child. You all know these stories, seeing that fire can extinguish human hair and rust can degrade iron. And I, I think this was a reaction uncommon for young children at the concrete operational stage, which I kind of, I kind of place them at that stage, I think, but I think more so indicating um, an early sensitive predisposition for intense inner experience. So as an adult though, his friends remarked about his indomitable optimism and tranquil acceptance of circumstances. Um, but late in life when he's in China and in New York, he shares several um, instances of great anxiety and emotional upset with his close friends. Um, that may have had, I think, both situational and health triggers as sufferers of heart disease commonly experience extreme anxiety. So it would be hard to sort of tease apart what may be a psychological inheritance, um, a genetic predisposition, situational triggers, which he certainly could have had, or his health, which causes or at least adds to that anxiety. So in addition to what may have been like a predisposition for his behaviors, um, he seemed to take, choose to take his disappointments 
sort of philosophically, both as a rational choice, given that his reaction was the only thing he could control under the circumstances. And I think as well, a firmly implanted religious perspective that requires him to submit to God's inscrutable will. That's kind of how we do or we did think. Um, he had, he had uh, also this highly developed sense of the spiritual value of suffering. So I think that helped. But all these factors helped him to cope. But from a psychological perspective, these feelings unsuccessfully sublimated may take their toll in some way. Um, Teilhard was aware of psychoanalytic theory. Um, he knew Marie Choisy, who was a psychoanalyst, and he's seen in a meeting with uh, Jacques Lacan. Um, so he's familiar of, with psychoanalytic theory and certainly with psychological theory in general. Um, and he considered sublimation of his feelings as an effective psych psychic tool. And in fact, if you go back and read a little bit on um, his writings on chastity, he, he calls that the Western road to spiritualization is, the, is a sublimation. So um, as advanced Teilhard was in his thinking, and despite his heralding the place of matter in his philosophy, it's unclear for me if he may have been fully cognizant of the potential negative effects of the inner on the outer. That is the physical toll of his crushing disappointments and terrible tragedies, such as the loss of his brothers and sisters he was so close to. Um, I don't have this photo with me, but you all may have seen in the album, there's a very commonly seen photo of um, one of my friends out there might actually have it to show um, with Teilhard at his ordination. And the picture that the ordination, everyone has sort of this blank look on their face and it's a picture together at what should have been a very, very, probably the biggest event in the, in the life of a priest is ordination. And they're all, there's like distance between all the family members. And of course that had all occurred after they had lost yet another child. Um, so going to Teilhard's actual cause of death, um, it's still unclear what the actual cause was. Because in a letter to the Jesuit superior from Father Leroy, his close friend, um, he states that Teilhard had a cerebral aneurysm. Other accounts, Teilhard is said to have had a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. Uh, but I don't know how they could certainly have reached the conclusion of the cerebral aneurysm because there was no autopsy. Um, and Dr. Samard, by the way, was unavailable at the time of death. But without um, a CAT scan, it would be hard to diagnose the injury that caused his death and determine whether it was, in fact, an aneurysm that caused a hemorrhagic stroke or a clot resulting in a stroke, which is obviously a common risk factor of heart disease. Um, so I don't know how they could have made, drawn these conclusions. I suspect that maybe the cerebral aneurysm, he did hit his head. So there was some bleeding from that. He probably had a good bruise on his head. So maybe they saw that and made some sort of uh, connection there. Um, but the only thing we do know from witnesses is that Teilhard went suddenly. He was standing and he was participating in conversation when he just suddenly dropped to the floor. So that means he had a complete momentary loss of consciousness rather than the sort of pain and gradual loss of strength that would become, that would come from a gradual, you know, a reduction in blood flow to the heart or to the brain. Uh, you've all seen, some people have heart attacks. They, 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 you know, they get some pain in their chest. They feel differently. And if you get a cerebral aneurysm, something happened to your brain, the blood flow doesn't stop. Like all of a sudden you don't just pass out. Normally you get a terrible, terrible headache or you start to feel differently or your cognition changes, something changes, but he just, he, he just dropped. So um, I think um, this sudden cardi, I think my, my, and it's not just mine, I did talk, I'll tell you who I talked this about, but I think, um, I think it was sudden cardiac arrest brought on by an arrhythmia. And that seems the most likely to this, due to the sudden loss in consciousness without some immediately precipitating symptoms. Um, an arrhythmia would drop you pretty quickly. And the fact that he, when he hit the floor and was on the floor and then was horizontal, a small amount of blood flow could make its way then to the brain for a momentary, you know, moment of consciousness before then he was completely gone. He only had a moment where he came back. So that, that could have, you know, allowed a small amount of blood flow to the brain just for that moment. Um, so I did talk to our heart specialists um, at the hospital where I worked and gave them, this is, this is all the data that we have. 
And that was what they thought, that it was probably an arrhythmia as opposed to NMI or certainly um, the cerebral aneurysm. Arrhythmia seems like the most um, probable cause. And again, the fundamental causes of the arrest, the weakened heart muscle from cardiomyopathy, perhaps valve disease, coronary artery, artery disease, any of that could have been related to his long-term stress. So it's impossible at this point to know if in fact he did have a congenital heart defect or any number of sequelae associated with heart disease. But one thing can be speculated, I think. Um, the emotional stress placed upon Teilhard in his advanced age, despite his incredible ability to master it cognitively and effectively, most of the time, I say affectively, not effectively, but um, that may very well have taken a physiological toll on him. And although stress was generally considered at the time to be a contributor to disease, it isn't now until later we understand the mechanisms by which stress can and does injure the heart, which places the circulatory system, the possibility of embolism and stroke, you know, at a greater risk. So on top of that, further research in psychology has also informed us of the physiological effects of unrecognized trauma in all its forms. Uh, while Teilhard fully understood the importance of sublimation of emotional states in following the way of the cross with his acceptance of suffering and certainly made the connection between matter and spirit, he may not have made the connection in the intermediate steps between physiology and emotion. I, th I think at that time in history, both the masculine and religious response to trauma would be acceptance without complaint. And in his case, he would bois l'obstacle. Um, and that's the old Michelin tire advertisement he would have seen in billboards back in the day that says you just, he'll just swallow it. He'll, you know, the Michelin tire swallow the obstacle, he would just swallow it. And the moments that Teilhard would share his ang anguish or perhaps even fully recognize them seemed to be rare and short-lived and occurred later in life as his heart disease, untreatable at that time, would certainly have progressed. Um, today's research and trauma studies suggest necessary and salutary methods to process traumatic experience. And for those who adhere to traditional religious approaches, um, sometimes the practice of, of spiritual bypassing might encourage individuals to avoid processing the disturbing thoughts and emotion that might arise from past trauma. So that's just, just some speculation. Um, I should mention Kathy Duffy's book, which instructs us that um, though Teilhard faced his struggles head on without repression. So that tells me that he did really face these things head on. He didn't, he didn't repress them. I think, I think she's probably right. But all this said, uh, knowing what we know today about such things as stress, heart disease, and emotional trauma, one might well imagine that Teilhard died of a broken heart. So I think I still have some time and I just want to talk about some psychological aspects and I haven't checked the chat. Let me see here. Let's make sure there's nothing that I can't address. Like, uh, Yes, I will give you the um, page number for that quote. I have it in my thing. So don't let me forget. I will do that. Okay. So um, Psychologically speaking, um, in, in the 1950s, there was passion on both sides. The religious liberals who sought to deepen and expand the understanding of Christianity and the reactionaries who clung to dogma at, at a time of great change and instability. And the tension of this, um, I think, added to Teilhard's premonition. He wrote about what he, what he felt in these circumstances, this premonition of this is like this is the perfect timing for like a, a anti Perugia <laughs> second coming because of that tension, um, and as young you know um, Carl Jung I don't know if you're familiar with Carl Jung most of you are probably are he was a contemporary of Teilhard's and his psych psychoanalytical ideas gained traction through such outlets as um, Psyche magazine which was a magazine. Um, um, edited by Marie Choisy, who I already mentioned, a friend of Teilhard's. Um, so, and in fact, some of Teilhard's work was published in Psyche magazine, uh, La Femme de l'Espèce, um, December 9, 1952 was published there. So Teilhard contributed to a psychoanalytic uh, magazine while he was in New York. And so the ability to hold the tension of opposites in Jungian theory, 
can lead to like a higher level of integration. Um, but only after successfully negotiating the depths or the dark night, as, as we refer to it religiously. So I think Teilhard may have been adept at balancing otherwise contradictory concepts. I mean, when we think of it, matter, spirit, the within, the without, science, faith, past, future, conservatives versus liberals. Um, there's just a lot of opposites and, and, and he, he kind of feels that tension, I think. And in fact, there's a quote get provided by, again, Father Duance that Teilhard told him that sort of indicative of his awareness of that tension of the opposites. Teilhard writes, or he said to Father Duance, the powers of my being vibrate to one unique note, incredibly rich, where I distinguish, united without effort, the complete opposite tendencies. So again, the Jungian perspective is to hold contradictory images and concepts and transcend them and thereby release a creative energy. So as I say, Teilhard had a general understanding of psychoanalytic theory, which was very much discussed in intellectual circles in the 50s. Teilhard also read Time Magazine, and he did read the issue on Jung when it came out in February 55. Um, he does mention it. And one of the things, as you remember, that happened in the 50s was the assumption, the declaration of the assumption. That was one of those hugely re important religious events that took place while Teilhard was in New York. So Jung uh, considered the assumption as one of the most important events in, in religious history. Um, if, for those of you who may not remember or be familiar with the assumption uh, in 1950, the idea, the assumption is the idea that the Virgin Mary was bodily taken up into heaven and that was that was stated dogmatically and infallibly um, by definition by, by Pope Pius XII. Um, so Jung says, one could have known for a long time that there was a deep longing in the masses for an intercessor and a mediatrix who would at last take her place alongside the Holy Trinity, be received as queen of heaven and bride of the heavenly court. For more than a thousand years, it's been taken for granted that the mother of God dwelt there. And then he goes on to say in Answer to Job, um, one of his important books, Jung says, I consider it to be the most important religious event since the Reformation as the symbolic acceptance of the church of the feminine. So um, it was interesting that this was happening. Jung commented on it and Teilhard also commented on it. Teilhard also had strong feelings about the announcement of the assumption for its psychological implications, although not exactly interpreting these implications the same way Jung did. Um, but first of all, I should mention that Teilhard did criticize the issuance of the doctrine of the assumption for biological reasons. Um, he was frustrated that the church would continue to express itself in ways that modern people, scientists especially, would necessarily have to refute. But in the non-literal sense, Teilhard saw it as a necessary development in the Christian religion. Not so much because it gave women a high place of honor officially in the church, which would please apparently women, but more so because he felt men have a need to worship the feminine in this overly patriarchal system. Um, so he noted some of the famous male saints who were devoted primarily to the version. So he thought this whole assumption thing, it's not for the females for the representation, the males need that representation. So psychologically speaking, he saw this as helpful for worship in the Christian religion. Young's interpretation actually goes further and Teilhard doesn't really um, seem to recognize this, but um, Jung points out the recognition of the feminine in the Christian religion is representative of the emergence in the collective psyche of, of the actual subconscious, the feminine and the subconscious, which is usually important. Um, Kathy Duffy um, also mentions the psychic implications of his, of Teilhard's predicament with um, just in general, his wrenching decisions, which I say decisions between obedience and truth uh, when she talks about uh, this, about, about Teilhard's suffering in her book. And that when Teilhard had to succumb to the demands of his order, for example, to write the three statements professing obedience to the church doctrine, she writes that shock of this magnitude can be a means of positive self-transformation, a call to higher consciousness. So I think the psychological aspect of Teilhard as a man, uh, as a human being, um, I think that's, that's really valuable to be aware of. It draws us sort of closer to him and, and we maybe better understand where he's coming from.
but from a more from a more physiological point of view, um, his brain, his ability to produce both complex data driven data driven research papers, as well as poetic descriptions of mystical insights, suggests I think a highly integrated cognitive capacity using both sides of the brain or I guess you would say a developed neural network that works across the corpus callosum, that wall between the two sides. So the left and right brain dominance myth kind of has been debunked um, due to the complex ways that brain areas interact. And neuroscience has moved away from thinking in terms of just mapping functions within the brain. But um, it's more accepted that cognition is driven by sort of dynamic neural networks between different brain areas. So it, it may be how well the brain adapts, um, what we call neuroplasticity, according to the environment and the demands uh, placed upon it that maybe really matters most. Um, but I also noticed that there is, there is surely a certain lateralization of brain activity that is facilitated by the strength of neural connections. And that lateralization, surprisingly, switches to greater bilateralization with age and healthy adults. So that's something that uh, they noticed um, in, in research. And I thought that was an interesting thing for us old people, that this is an advantage, that you know we do have a certain level of lateralization, although the, there is different levels of communication, communication between the two sides. But the fact that we can actually think more bilaterally as we age, that's kind of an interesting thing. And I think Teilhard seemed to have a highly integrative capacity from early on. Um, which was, I think, further influenced by the challenging environments that he was placed in. And that may have, in fact, improved with age by the time he got to New York. So um, I see the time here. So I wanted, I wanted to just mention something about exile in, in just in general terms. Um, if you look up the, the definition of exile, I like the one that Wikipedia gives us. Um, it says exile is expulsion, expatriation, or prolonged absence from one's homeland under either the compulsion of circumstance or the rigors of some higher purpose. So it's that last part that I think is really appropriate for this case. So um, we've had kind of a biological view of things, but what about the thinking about the concept of exile itself? Um, according to the Greeks, exile was a fate worse than death. I mean, they'd rather die than to be taken away from their land and their people. Um, and there's a lot of famous stories that come from the experience of exile. Most commonly, you know, we have Ovid, not quite sure why he was at, nobody's quite sure why he got exiled. And Napoleon, we know why he got exiled, but he didn't do very well, he didn't last very long. Ovid did last pretty long and did some good work. Um, but there's one biblical and historical story of exile that we're all familiar with, which takes us out of the biological material realm into the spiritual value of exile, or perhaps even its place in the history of religion. And that is the Babylonian exile. So I pull from a paper written by George Barton, who was a really accomplished 20th century professor of Semitic languages and history of religion. So he explained that the influence of the Babylonian exile on the religion of Israel was crucial in clarifying religious perception and deepening mystical experience. This new theology of that period was offered through uh, Jeremiah and second Isaiah, where um, they suggest that religion was really supposed to be an inward experience of the heart, not dependent on the temples or specific rituals. As you remember at that time, we had the destruction of the temple at that time. So in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, it says that in the future, God's covenant was a covenant of the heart, not an outward covenant of stones and ceremonies. And this was a big change for that time. In fact, uh, the professor um, says that it was this inward attitude rather than the outward practice that kept the religion alive during the trauma of the exile of its higher officials, priests, and uh, the wealthy citizens, the ones who had to leave. The bulk of the population um, or the lower classes, they were able to remain in Palestine without a leader. Um, but this led to an apprehension of religious truth that otherwise may not have occurred, and the Judaism of later times could not have been born. So in a kind of parallel, 
When Teilhard found himself in the desert without the normal requirements for proper mass, he wrote the Mass in the World, which we continue to celebrate today, which we're celebrating the 100-year anniversary. Um, but a larger parallel is, of course, the development of a more evolved religion while remaining faithful to the original inspiration, which is exactly what Teilhard does. So I think further, we can make the case that the trauma of the experience of exile, the experience of exile, or the intense suffering that it produced was a factor not only in the development of Jewish thought, but perhaps a factor in the development of Teilhard's thought as well. Would he have thought what he thought or wrote what he wrote without the extensive experience of exile in his lifetime? Would it have had the intensity, the originality, or even the credibility Ability that it had under any other circumstances. Certainly, uh, he would have made the connections uh, between evolutionary history and religion due to the intersection between his scientific career and his personal history. But would his, would his insights have been as fully developed had he not suffered the stressors of exile, including alienation, the lack of logistical and emotional supports, um, while also in the presence of strong cultural influences from outside the world that he knew. Because um, I can say from personal experience, no one gives more thought to their own culture and belief system until they're faced with another one, until they're dropped into another place where it's completely different. And I noticed that living abroad. So in other words, here, it's not just suffering as we've so often noticed in the past that he recognizes and uses as a tool for his inner life but suffering within a particular container. Um, in, in Jungian sand play, which I, which I practice, two conditions are crucial to allow elements of the unconscious to emerge. You have to have a witness and you have to have a container. The witness has to be actively present yet not interfere and the container must be considered safe. And in Teilhard's case, I think we could argue these two variables maybe in discussion. Um, I think he had them. Uh, but it's arguable. Uh, nevertheless, I think that the exiles that Teilhard experienced may have been the crucibles most advantageous for the development of his thought. So I, I stop here, um, but I think what I'm trying to convey are the implications of matter for Teilhard's experience when so much is naturally focused on the spiritual side. Um, but keep in mind Teilhard's ideas on matter and its connection to spirit. As, as Teilhard said, we're still a work in progress. So it, it may be that despite his ideas on the topic, the actual practice of it um, outside his research and his clear, his obvious um, appreciation of nature, um, the practice of it in, in his own bodily person. Um, and maybe there's a lesson there. We pay a lot more attention to um, the body, the somatic expressions of psychic or emotional states now than I think than we did before. Some people think it's juju, but actually I think there's something to that. Somatic psychology is a thing. Um, and we continue to learn more from, you know, a variety of sources on experiencing things through the body. Um, rationalists denigrate this, but now science starts to step in and say, no, wait a minute, there is, there is something here. Uh, I, th I think um, exile was an, just another important cross for Teilhard to bear on our behalf um, and considering the human side of his experience, um, the connection to home and family, especially during the tribulations of old age, that we can relate even more to his sacrifice and maybe this will bring us closer to him. Um, we've only got like five minutes left um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check the chat here real quick because I have the number of books I want to mention to you guys. Somebody asked for the page number. I'm going to get that right now because I think I actually included that in here. I will get that page number. Um, that's funny that you guys asked for that. That's good. Let's see. Okay. It's page 167, 168 in Letters to Two Friends. And if you don't see it there, I may be good. Uh, because I have a French version and and then it, of course it, anyhow, but you should see. I think I used the the regular version that came out in the in the states because it's called something different in France. So page one sixty seven, one sixty eight, and let me see here. Let me go to my chat. 
Oh, okay, I gave you the page number. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so Tracy, why don't uh, let you let me thank you for this lecture first, and we can get to the chat later and all the questions. Okay, okay so I'm going to let you but, guys work on that. Should I mention those books? Should I wait until no, we have, see if we have time to mention we go. Yeah. And I just want to thank you for the wonderful insights medical psychological you know the the whole uh, the sense of exile i think you've shed a lot of light on those uh, topics that i um, i wasn't you know i wasn't aware of even though you know that i'm interested in all of that too it's it, it, you know my interest but um but i'm just grateful for all your, your sharing so your it's this talk was very different from the um the monograph so it's wonderful it, it really fills in some of the gaps so we really appreciate that now uh andrew is going to take over and he will um you know help you with a chat you don't have to worry about reading it and we'll just ask you and then you can answer the questions and and we i i'd encourage everybody in the audience to please uh you know put something in there a comment a question whatever you would like Thank you so much, Tracy. That was really wonderful. I was looking at my notes here, and I think you hit a Jungian quaternity in terms of the physiological, the psychological, the spiritual, and then something of like the sociological too, in terms of his exile. So <laughs> kudos to you. That was really excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to our first question here from Gail, who said that she read your monograph and was very moved. She's asking if you could speak a bit about how you came to focus on his years in New York City and how, and how your research developed? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, why New York? Um, so for a couple of very specific reasons. Um, one is um, my family's from New York and now I live in New York. Um, and I, I, have, I studied him when I was in Paris and, his, and I found all his places in Paris. So I thought in New York, I'll have to know the places in New York. But then I was pushed really to study harder because we were planning this 100 year anniversary of Teilhard's Mass in the World which occurred, is it two weeks ago now, I think, um, led by um, our president, Sister Duffy. So that was an amazing event, but we, we were planning that event for a year to two years out. So um, the French, who I know very well from my living over there, said, well, Tracy, you're going to talk about Teilhard in New York. And of course, what do I know about Teilhard? Nothing, right? <laughs> and of course, our president, uh, Sister Duffy, said, well, if you're going to do that, why don't you write something about Teilhard in New York? Don't, you know, you know, kill two birds with one stone. So since I had a lot of time to think about it over that year to two years, I just kept reading all kinds of things just... I mean, Teilhard has written so much, it's hard to grasp it all. So it was actually a gift to focus on one narrow time in his life. And I I, I was glad to uh, focus on the last one because it sort of takes in everything he's experienced in his whole life and crystallizes it, distills it into this moment in time in New York right before he dies. You know, I figure it's that's that's like the best time. And plus, I know New York. So the connection between New York and Teilhard at the very end of his life where he's put it all together. Um, and I didn't realize how much I'd actually find. I thought it was going to be impossible to write. Who's going to find information on Teilhard in New York? I mean, where is that? Right. But I'm fortunate in that I do uh, speak French. So in going to a lot of the French and I'll show this if we we'll have time at the end, the French versions of letters like his letters, he wrote almost daily to Jean Mortier uh, during the time that he was in New York. So he's every day talking about what he's doing, what he's seeing, what he's thinking. Um, that was a great help. And, and Jean Mortier was also one of our first honorary vice presidents, I think, of the ATA. She was the uh, person, if you, in case you don't remember, was the one who um, he willed his works to her. And I just learned in a book out by The Making of the Phenomenon of Man that I'll talk about that Jean Mortier was really pressured after Teilhard died by Vatican authorities saying, no, you're not, you're not publishing this. You're not, you know, you need to be a nice, good religious Catholic woman and do what you're told. And, um, and she was very pious, very close to the church, but she said, no, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. So I was interested, something interesting that I just learned recently. So I, I, so it was by necessity that I focused on New York, but then when I started it, the connections all started coming together and I just found it so enriching. There's probably more information that you were looking for, but 
That was excellent, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, we have Annie Spade here, who is a very vibrant, active member of the Terra de Chardin Facebook group. So we're glad to have some representation from the, uh, their group here. Annie asks, <clears throat> she, excuse me, she says, what about the effect of his ongoing struggles with Lucille? At the very least, because of her ongoing lack of peace over the path, um, as he vowed, as a vowed priest, chose for them. Up until the last weeks of his life, he wrote to her regarding hoping things between them will, quote, gradually calm down. <laughs> yeah. So why didn't I write about that or talk about that? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I think it's an important topic. I do. I think it's addressed in a lot of different ways and different writings. I mean, the book is out there of the letters. So when I focus specifically on New York, um, I didn't focus much on those because I, I felt that that was a relation. When he wrote to Lucille, it was really about him and Lucille. It wasn't about what he was thinking about New York, what he was doing in New York. It was about this wrenching relationship that was so important. Um, but it was really about him and her and working through this period. So, um, of course, it could have been included, but I think um, Sister Duffy would have like smacked me over the head with a ruler or something if I added any more pages to this to this monograph. So it really was about his overall interaction with New York, feeling about New York, his day to day life in New York in preparation for French people and hopefully American people who were coming to New York specifically for that purpose to know what life was like for him in New York. So uh, Lucille's letters wasn't really that helpful in creating that New York picture for him. Very important in its own, it, in its own, I think. I agree. Very, and if I did, if you, somebody would allow me to write more, I would write more. <laughs> <laughs> so Tracy, I have a question. Um, when we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Mass on the World, uh, in the program for the Mass on the World, there was at the very end a note about Terrence's death when he was visited by the priest that came to give him uh, the last rites, where I believe, if I my memory serves me correctly, uh, he was laying on the ground and his head was facing, <clears throat> excuse me, the west and his feet were facing the east. Is that correct? Yeah, I, as okay. I remember. Yeah, I can pull so it up. I'm just curious what your Jungian interpretation of that is. <laughs> Well, you know, um, people question uh, the specifics of memory. I, I know that Frank would would bring up the specifics of memory and how good was his memory. And and did he have a compass with him when he went to deliver uh, the last rites? So um, so it was interesting that you mentioned that, because in my 20 years of reading about Teilhard, I had never heard anything about him getting the last rites or who was called or what happened. So it was literally by chance by finding something in the ATA archives that pointed me in the direction of finding this book by this person who wrote a chapter on Teilhard. And I, frankly, his chapter on Teilhard was, nah, I didn't agree with a lot of stuff that he said. But what he did include was an excerpt of a word for word letter that he received from Father Father Garati on his experience, which I thought was so beautifully written. So we wonder if 20 years after the fact, you know, how accurate was it? But I think it is accurate in, in obviously the logistics of it, but memory will, when you, when you dwell on an event that's so important, I mean, you just witnessed that you just gave last rites to somebody you under, from what you've heard is a saint. So pretty psychologically strong experience. Right. So um, from a Jungian perspective, I would ask you as the Jungian expert here, what do you <laughs> think with lead, lead, east, west? You know, the, I don't, yeah, frankly, I don't know what Jung would say about the directional orientation of finding him. But what would you say? Because that's an interesting point. Well, I'm no expert, but I would say something to the effect of, um, you know, he was really trying to bring back these ideas that he really put in the crucible in the east and his experience there back to a Western mind in a way. And mm -hmm if we were to consider the paradigms of science now and how they're shifting and changing and there's more and more emerging, especially, you know, when we get into the quantum realm of interconnectedness and consciousness, we find he's more and more vindicated. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Yeah. That's very insightful. That's just off the cuff, but I mean, <laughs> that, 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 that kind of stuff is fun for me. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I do think, uh, you know, according to Jung, the psyche does have a life of its own 
mm. which of course we don't understand or not even aware of. But as Teilhard, it was interesting how strongly Teilhard was interested in psychoanalytic theory. I mean, he went kind of, I mean, his ideas on, on spirituality were not that far away from what they were talking about at that time. So they mm. do, and I guess from, there have been a couple of books written too on, on the intersection of Teilhard's thought and Jungian thought. So, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions they would like to put in the chat or if you would like to raise your hand too, <clears throat> we can field a question that way. Um, Mary Claire says, I agree with you, Tracy, regarding the omission of his relationship with Lucille. However, perhaps occasionally too much is made of this influence on his theories. Yeah, so too much is made of of Lucille's influence or uh that's the way I read the question. Maybe Mary Claire would like to to say it. Yeah, maybe. Maybe Mary Claire, yes. Is can can you uh I'll I just asked oh, Lucille's influence. You. Okay. Oh, Lucille's influence. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you said yeah, perhaps too much is made of Lucille's influence. Mm -hmm. Um you know, possibly um because, you know, obviously he had, Taylor had a number of, of friends. Uh, people don't talk about so much about his amazing male friends, you know, um, that he stayed in touch with over over the years, like um, Valencin. You know, I loved his, his description of Valencin. Um, he, he described as an, an aristocrat of the mind, right? Valencin was a very literary guy. Um, and his relationships with a lot of his uh, male peers were very strong, very close. And Lucille's, of course, was very important. And but so was many of the other female friends that he had. Um, it's just that we, we know more about um, his and Lucille's interaction because of the great work that was done um, by Lucille's niece mm -hmm. in her cooperation with, um, with Thomas King, um, and with the Teilhard family to actually publish those letters. So that way, you know, we obviously know more about her because of the work that they did. Um, it's not all the letters have received as much attention. Thank you. Oh, and Annie, uh, no, is it Tess? Tess has her hand raised. Is that right? Thank you, Sister Duffy. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Tracy. It was wonderful. I visited the uh, Jesuit residence uh, the week after the the big celebration. I unfortunately I couldn't be there then. Um, did Teilhard live in the city, or did he live at the Jesuit residence? And it seemed so large. Was there a large community of Jesuits there oh. at the time? Yeah, absolutely. So um, his first. The first few years he lived at the residence, which is as since you were at the residence, you see the residence is on 83rd Street, kind of around the corner from the church and down. The location is the same. The building has changed a bit um, since he lived there, but I think the courtyard is still the same location. Uh, I was going through it a little bit with the Jesuits that are there now. So he lived at the residence. Um, which isn't the rectory, you know, out on Park Avenue, you see a big sign that says rectory right next to, but that wasn't really, he was at the residence along with some, there were about 70 Jesuits assigned at that time and lived at that residence. So it was huge. Um, they used a word for it, like carnival-like or like a big train station. There was so much activity all the time because they had not just one, but two high schools there, uh, as well as, you know, that the parish of St. Ignatius is a very rich, very large parish. And then they had so many more Jesuits stationed in New York at that time. Like I mentioned, the uh, Woodstock Jesuits that were in New York, they're long gone. Um, but they had Jesuits there for all kinds of different assignments that would be lodged there at the residence. Um, so, yeah, it was very large and it was right down the street there on 83rd Street. But his burial site, um, now the Culinary Institute, uh, uh -huh. he spend any time there that was simply where he was buried is that the case right the, the, at that time it was the jesuit seminary mm -hmm. um so that was yeah. the closest jesuit cemetery they just i mean they had his funeral like that like he died on sunday it had the funeral on tuesday it was to be on wednesday but they had it on tuesday um no preparation and he was shipped up to the cemetery the closest jesuit cemetery plot the jesuits have a rule you're supposed to be buried where you drop 
So whatever the closest cemetery is, that's where you go. Yeah. Thanks, Tracy. But he did spend time in upstate New York because he went up to Westchester to purchase New York to visit Roger Strauss's mansion. He went out to Long Island to visit Childs Frick's mansion out there. So he did get around uh, New York for sure. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Annie has her hand up. Well, I really wanted to thank you, Tracy, also from the aspect of I've been in Montessori working with very young children for decades. And the way that you articulated the way a child integrates the environment that they grow up in was really gorgeous. I, I look forward to, to seeing exactly how you you named that. So I, I wanted to give you that real appreciation for that aspect. The other thing I wanted to, to call in is Jean Houston's experience of Tehard. Um, because to me, and I've been going around talking about this for a while now um, in different um, meetings and whatnot, that, you know, it was really, to me, I see that where he, he's, you know, in awe, he's awestruck and, and entering the experience of communion with the caterpillar and, you know, inviting her to commune with the clouds and the wind and all of that. I mean, to me, Tayard was living his inner child. And as you talk about him being in exile from, you know, the, the physical space, you know, in France, I'm seeing him reaching out to, to be at home where, you know, here on the planet with, with these, these familiars, with these subjects. And so yeah, I, I just really want to want to um, call that in too as well. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting you mentioned that because I just um, reread Jean Houston's story last night, thinking about all this. And um, I didn't know who Jean Houston was until I'd heard about her story associated with Tayard. Um, so I know I've heard about it over the years. So um, since that took place in New York, I had to give it some serious thought. Um, and from what I understand, Jean Houston is a really neat lady, very interesting, very powerful in her communication and her connection with people. Um, she herself is an amazing lady. Um, but I, I, I have a hard time making sense of her story um, because last night I was reading it. She was 14, she said, when she met Tayard. She would have been 14 in 1951. He got there at the end of 51, probably 52, that he could have met her. Um, but that's okay. Maybe she was 15, no big deal. But she describes in her story that she saw him at one point once a week, and then later was Tuesdays and Thursdays every week for that last year of his life. So that would have been 1954, 55. She would have been 17 at that time. So when you're young, different, big difference between 14 and 17. I mean, you know, between 34 and 37, you don't know, but between 14 and 17, that's a big difference. So, um, and then as she points it out, that last year of his life, she says she's meeting him. Um, uh, uh, Tess had brought up, you know, where exactly was he? So, um, I, and I forgot to mention that, yeah, he was at the Jesuit residence, not there on 83rd and Park, but down the street on 83rd, only during those first few years. But since they had to do the renovation, uh, the Jesuits were so kind to him. He was one of the handful of Jesuits they kicked out to make room to do the renovation. You know, you pick the older guy who has a heart problem, who's a foreigner, he's the one that has to go find it. I mean, I'm not, I shouldn't say that because, you know, it may have made a lot of sense at the time because other people were, I don't know, there might probably there was some sense to it, but it just doesn't seem terribly fair to say, but anyhow, that last year of his life, 54 to 55, he wasn't living up at that Jesuit residence. He was living further downtown. Um, he wasn't going to St. Ignatius on a regular basis. He was going, he would, he would have, when he lived there, he would have gone to the residence. But after like 54 and that last year of his life, he did visit the community about once a month. And from several sources, I put this together. He went to the community about once a month as sort of an obligation to be present in the community, to give his, um, to give his penance to the father ministry and give his confession. So about once a month, he would walk from 71st Street all the way up to 83rd Street on Park Avenue, or actually between Park and, and, um, and Fifth, and um, meet with 
the head of the congregation about once a week and have lunch with the community and say hello and all that kind of stuff. But that was about once a month. And he wouldn't have gone in the main entrance there at the church. That would be silly. He would have gone to the residence to meet with you know, the father minister, which is down the street. So this is another reason why I don't understand how, I mean, probably Jean met him at some point in her lifetime. Right. Um, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised because she's met, she's also met like Einstein and Eleanor Roosevelt. And right. somehow she's managed to meet all these amazing people. Probably the power of her personality. She has met all these people. But I just logistically, I can't seem to make any sense of it. Right. Well, the interesting thing, though, Tracy, is that she had no idea who he was. Of course. Right. And then it was years and years later that she's at a conference and sees this picture on a book and real makes the connection. So then, you know, you can imagine then she's trying to reconstruct. Well, when was exactly. you know, on that? So I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. So in the reconstruction in her mind, she lives in New York. She went to Barnard. So she went down the street. She sees where the St. Ignatius is located. She sees it says rectory on the top. So she says, this is where I came. I met him every week until he died. And then he didn't show up anymore. So the time, you know, so memory is a strange thing. Right. Um, and she she encourages people to go on this process of imagining meeting famous people and having a conversation with them. And it is a very interesting method to actually clarify your thoughts and all that. So it is something that she works with all the time. So, um, but anyhow, a really amazing lady. Her description of Tayar doesn't match the description of other witnesses. I've read a whole lot of witnesses that read in the, in the, in the literature that had knew him and talked with him and met with him. And the description that she gives of his behavior, it doesn't sound like him at all. I, I mean, I hate to say that, um, but um, because I love the story, it's a fun story, everybody, but the, the events that she describes in Central Park were not ways that, I mean, because he did go to Central Park with Mrs. Strauss, Roger Strauss's wife, and she describes, she writes a long chapter on his behavior with her. She had her French lessons with him, they walked in Central Park, they went to the zoo together, um, so her, she describes how he behaves at the zoo. Right. So um, and it's nothing like what Gene talks about. All his friends, his close friends who describe their interactions with him. It sounds completely different from what Gene gives us. Only thing I can say is she was a young person. So maybe that that brought. Maybe that's up. that's. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, there thank was. A, yeah. Thank you, Annie, for that. Um that was a, an interesting point of conversation that came up um, during the conference, too, just a couple weekends ago. And it was a really interesting dialogue to just hear the different perspectives on how these anecdotes get passed along and, um, you know, what evidence we do have that's concrete that we can pull out, what we can speculate. So, I mean, yeah, we can speculate. I mean, it's and it's wonderful for our imagination. But I felt an obligation in writing the little monograph that I wrote. I have to make sure I have evidence in the text for everything I say. So I didn't have evidence in the text for that story. So I just kind of left it out. That's good. So we do have a, there may be a point of clarification here that um, Odile is asking. She says, thanks for the presentation. Tared was homesick, he was sick. Uh, did he think that he would never come back to his homeland and die in exile? Yeah, I think that when he accepted New York, um, looking at his letters, his thought was, OK, I'm going to be in New York for a while, but I can always go back to France for summers and spend time. Because in France, that's the thing. You spend at least six weeks back at the family um, estate. Um, and and that's, you know, that, that's just so much part of their culture. Um, but his one of his summers, he couldn't go because he had to he, he actually took another trip to South Africa, another another summer he went to California. Um, the summer before he actually went, he had requested to go and they didn't allow him to go. So that was disappointing for him when they said, no, you're not going. So he actually did something else. Um, and then the summer that he actually finally could go and did go. The sad part about it was um, he was people heard that he was coming. Somebody set up a speech for him. And when the word got out, there was so much attention to it that people at the Vatican got word of it. And they wrote to his superior in Paris, Father Duance, and said, Teilhard is in your neighborhood. He needs to go back to the United States. So he had waited so long for that time to get back to France. And then in the middle of it, he got the word and he tried to appeal it um, through his 
superior, Father Ravier, who was in Lyon, that was his immediate superior, who was a wonderful man and tried his best to help him. And he said, you know, look, just send an appeal. I'm not doing anything. I'm going to my family's house after this. Uh, I wanted to go to the American embassy on Place de Concorde in Paris to personally present my papers, to request my permanent visa. That's on my leads. That's what I'm, I need to do while I'm here. That's why I'm here, just to see the family get my visa. And so Ravier put forward that information for him to ask them to let him to stay. And guess what? The answer was no. After he went to that nice trip to Sarsana and visited his birthplace and saw the Jesuits at Lyon, had a good trip. But he said, you know, when you come back, sorry, it's oh, it's over. You got to go. You got to go back. So that was really, really sad. And he was really depressed when he got back to the United States. But he, I think he felt, yeah, I am going to die in a foreign land. I, I, I do think he he believed because I think he felt that that his the time was coming and he kind of felt pressured to get to communicate what he wanted to communicate before it was too late. But I really think he was he was he was afraid that he would die. I mean, I don't think he was afraid of it. Um, I just think he really and I don't know if he admitted it that much to himself, but he would say things like, you know, that the spirit blows stronger in France, that I need to get back and, and reprendre bas, which means to get my bearings back. I need to, you know, restabilize. Um, so many times in little asides to all his letters to friends and colleagues, he would mention the need to get back to Paris. But I think he knew that might not happen. It's a lot to internalize. Yeah. Mm. Hard not to take it personally. Tracy, thank you for fielding questions. This has been phenomenal to hear even more of your insight regarding this topic that, like you said, you had the opportunity to really hone in on and focus. So thank you for taking the time and effort to do that. We are very grateful for it. I'm grateful for all you guys who came that we can share information and we can have discussions. So uh, thank you so much for coming. And now I am going to bring up Sister Kathy, if I can find her here. <laughs> there I am. <clears throat> there she is. We're gonna yeah. put her so I just wanted to thank you again, uh, Tracy. And uh, um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed with all of this rest of the material. We'll have to have part two of <laughs> another <laughs> monograph but anyway thank you and i uh, and i want to thank everybody too for coming and for you know sharing your comments and questions and uh keep keep your eyes on our website we'll be advertising more uh events for next uh, year as uh, starting in january so we'll have that out soon i hope and so and and before we go i just wanted to show uh share the screen again Okay, I just want to be sure that you get the website. I know Andrew put it in the chat, but if you're interested in going to our website, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, and my email is down at the bottom too if you need to ask a question. And then also the Institute for Religion and Science is another good place for these topics. And so we have some Teardian uh, speakers too, uh, who um, have lectures on that website. So, uh, you know, write that down. And we have reading groups, reading circles, several of those and uh, all kinds of things going on. So we hope that you will join us, um, uh, you know, at, with the, um, at the, the Tayard Association, we're growing each, each year, we seem to be growing more and more. And we hope that uh, you know, hope to make a groundswell. So thank you very much for coming, huh? And um, we'll see you again, hopefully. Bye, and thanks, Tracy. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night.